Okay, so now we're going to shift gears talking about contraception or how not to get pregnant. So before we get started, so far we've talked about the three different trimesters of pregnancy with the different events that occur during them, as well as the three different stages of birth, talking about how birth in humans is difficult because of our large brains due to our, or excuse me, large heads because of our large brains, and we have a relatively small pelvis because we walk upright. So stage one is those regular uterine contractions that push the baby's head down against the cervix to dilate it. And we have that positive feedback loop mediated by the hormone oxytocin produced by the pituitary gland. Once the cervix is completely dilated and out of the way, you enter stage two, which is voluntary pushing, and uh, which is got, it can last not very long to a couple of hours, Right, and when the baby's head is descending the skin of the perineum that is crowning, we talked about how the head is usually the largest part, but sometimes the shoulders can be pretty big as well. And that how after the baby is born, that transition to regulating their own temperature and breathing on their own is quite a big deal. Stage three is when the placenta detaches from the uterus and gets pushed out. It's soft and mushy and easy to do. And there will be a little bit of bleeding after that, but the uterus should contract down on itself to put pressure on that raw spot and keep the bleeding to a minimum, hopefully. We also talked about how we have a lot of medical interventions in childbirth in the United States. We use epidural anesthesia at quite high rates. We also have a relatively high C-section rate compared to some other countries. And so there are certainly some benefits associated with these, but some risks as well. We also talked about how we actually have a pretty high maternal mortality rate in the United States compared with other developed nations, and ours has been increasing where theirs has been decreasing. Most notably in our country, we have a very high maternal mortality rate for women of color. We also talked about the three major causes of death, so thromboembolism, that's that DVT and PE, or pulmonary embolus, a blood clot that can travel into the lungs and can be life-threatening, hemorrhage or excessive bleeding, and preeclampsia and eclampsia, which is that weird syndrome with high blood pressure, protein in the urine, swelling, and can cause seizures, organ failure, and death. So. What about if you don't want to get pregnant? Okay, so conception, right, is fertilization or the beginning of a pregnancy. So contraception, contra meaning going against, is how can you prevent conception, right? So contraception is birth control. So this is not new that people have wanted to prevent getting pregnant and yet still be able to have intercourse. So there's a long history of attempts to prevent conception or contraception. So one of, some of the oldest examples are pessaries. So pessaries are little devices, usually these are sponges for the most part with some strings around them that were then inserted into the vagina. So I apologize that there's not kind of a ruler or something for scale here. But all of these devices are relatively small, so the largest ones would maybe be the diameter of, oh, I don't know, an apple, right? So relatively small, um, so that they can be pushed up into the vagina, and the goal was that they would prevent the semen from being able to get up into the uterus. Of course, people didn't really understand where it was going back then, but to be able to block that transmission of the semen. Interestingly, they used lots of different compounds in these pessaries, including a very popular one in ancient Egypt was uh, crocodile dung. So um, pretty interesting history there. In ancient Rome, they actually, from what we can tell, they had a plant called silphium that was taken kind of as an herbal medicine and worked as a contraceptive. And what we're seeing here is an image of that plant being printed on a coin because that plant became so sought after. It became so valuable um, that it was uh, quite the commodity. And in fact, it was in such demand that they over harvested it and that plant has been extinct, right? So people just used it all up. They couldn't get enough of it and didn't um, 
protect and propagate it. In ancient China and other Southeast Asian countries, there are rumors and tales of certain sexual practices that men could do in order to prevent themselves from ejaculating so they could still orgasm yet not ejaculate. We don't really have any data to back up whether that's truly possible or not, but it's an interesting idea. And in the 10th century, Avicenna, who was a physician in the Arab region, he actually detailed more than 20 different herbal compounds that could be used for contraception. Unfortunately, his works were lost um, because they got burned during the Inquisition, right? So he was an infidel. And so when the Inquisition came by and got rid of anybody and anything that wasn't um, Christian, his works were actually lost to us, which is quite too bad. So after the Inquisition went through, people really didn't know much about how to prevent pregnancy. There were some wise women, quote, right, who would prescribe some herbal tinctures or perhaps pessaries. We don't know much about them. They often didn't leave a written record, nor do we know how effective they were. We do know that it was relatively common practice in medieval England to perform infanticide. So here we see an example of some people getting rid of an unwanted infant, weighing it down the stones and dropping it in the river. Um, so that was not at all unheard of. Uh, if you had another mouth to feed and you didn't have enough food to go around for the children you already had, this was not uncommon. However, a couple of things then occurred. One was that the Catholic Church uh, became really upset by this and started saying, no, actually, you can't murder your babies. The other thing that happened um, is plague, actually. And so when plague hit Europe, the the problem now was not too many people, right? The problem was too few people. And so everyone was trying to have more children to keep the population up because in any given plague year between 10 and sometimes 30% of the population would die out. So that's kind of um, ancient history. Um, if we move into more of the modern era, this, oh, oh, sorry, I forgot. They did have condoms. <laughs> so we do have some historical evidence that people had condoms back then. They were usually made out of linen which if you've ever worn a linen shirt or something, you know, would not be particularly effective. Um, or they were made out of uh, pig's bladders or animal intestines, which is a little bit more effective. However, at the time, they were usually um, used to protect against infections, not pregnancy. And so here's an image of Casanova, right? The French nobleman known for being quite the lover. And so he was one of the first people that we know historically used condoms. Um, but again, it was to prevent infections, not so much to prevent pregnancy. In the modern era, so by which I mean once kind of the scientific revolution started taking place and industrialization started occurring, uh, they did develop in the early 1800s, actually Durex, which is still a brand of condom produced today, which is kind of cool came out with the first vulcanized rubber condom that was sold um, kind of as a one. You, you would buy one and you would wash it out and reuse it, uh, which, you know, we can have some concerns about that for sure. But the first condom um, actually came out in the early 1800s. So that's kind of exciting. The only problem was in the late 1800s, there were the Comstock laws and all kinds of other government uh, regulations for the suppression of vice, right? So they would ban anything that was pornographic, um, including contraception. So it was felt that anything that was intended to help prevent conception from occurring was obscene and therefore should be outlawed. And so um, these really kind of fell by the wayside and were seen as only something used by degenerates and criminals, yeah? And then it wasn't until the early 1900s when Margaret Sanger, who you'll learn about in the documentary, kind of said, well, this is crazy. We have women who are basically chained to babies that they don't want. They have to have sex with their husbands because they're expected to have sex with their husbands. And the possibility of saying no was not something that existed 
then, certainly not even legally. And so she said, this is crazy. We need to come up with uh, a way to make this legal and make it available to people. So that'll be um, featured in the documentary. And so some of these laws then started to be repealed and we see kind of a blossoming of interest in contraception. And in fact, we in the lead up to World War II, there were two physicians, one in Germany and one in Japan, who invented the first IUDs or intrauterine devices. And so you can see these were circular rings that were inserted up into the uterus to help prevent pregnancy. Then World War II happened and these were largely kind of lost uh, for many decades until this concept was resurrected. So this is just that information I just spoke to you. And so this brings us to the mid 20th century, so the 1950s. And at that time, there weren't really many effective contraceptive options. So condoms, as I mentioned, had a bad rap, right? Only morally degenerate people used condoms. Um, diaphragms were available, but they were hard to get and not easy to use. And we haven't talked about those yet, but they're basically these little rubber domes that you insert up into the vagina that cover the cervix and prevent semen from being able to get up through the cervix into the uterus and therefore the fallopian tube. The Catholic Church in the 1950s prohibited contraception, and in fact, they still do. And in many states, contraception was actually illegal. It was actually a felony. Um, and so women had few good options, right? It was either don't have sex or unless you're infertile, you were gonna be having children. So this is kind of the framing for where the documentary is. So at this point, when we're meeting in person, we typically watch a documentary video called The Pill, which is part of a series run by PBS called American Experience. I've tried really hard to be able to get that in an online format for you, and it's just not available anywhere. We've searched high and low. There are just a few old crusty DVDs, and that's not going to help us out. So instead, we have two articles to read uh, that are posted in Canvas. The first is John Rock's Error, written by Malcolm Gladwell, and the second one is an article about the pill in Smithsonian Magazine, written by Natalie Angier. They're both excellent authors, so I hope you enjoy those articles, and there will be questions based on that reading material on uh, your weekly quiz. All right, so have fun reading about the history of hormonal contraception, right, using hormones for birth control in those two articles. And then we will pick up next time talking more in detail about the different forms of birth control and contraception that are available.